Um, as I mentioned yesterday, we have joining us today Bill Wake, who is one of the key influencers for the practice of Agile. And one of Bill's many interests and areas of practice around Agile is the user story. And so he's going to tell you a little bit about the practice of Agile in real life and, and how what he's learned about it and how he's improved it. And you'll see some of Bill's work, the INVEST acronym in particular, in today's, um, in today's follow on and the uh, assignments you guys are going to do for the end of the week. Um, Bill is a computer scientist by training, and he has been working on the practice of Agile for quite a while, I think basically since the beginning. Is that, is that right, Bill? Right. 2003. <laughs> and um, so he's done a lot of really thoughtful and extremely useful work around what makes for good user stories and what makes for good collaborations, among other things. So um, thanks for joining us today, Bill. Thanks for having me. And can we make Bill full screen? Thanks. <laughs> All right. And I'm assuming you hear me? Yep. OK, great. Yeah. <laughs> yes. See if I can uh, share my screen and a little presentation. And hopefully you're seeing uh, the title slide. Yep. All right. Um, so thanks, Alex. Uh, Alex asked me to speak a little about myself and then uh, kind of uh, how I got tied to XP and some things on user stories and how to work with uh, teams. So a um, uh, quick background for me. Um, like you said, I'm kind of a computer science person by trade. I worked as a compiler writer at DEC or digital, if anybody's old enough to remember them. Um, I went back to school, uh, didn't finish my PhD, but was looking at information retrieval and ended up working on a variety of systems such as libraries, phone systems, and banks. And then around 2001, became an independent consultant in the XP space, uh, took a couple years off to manage uh, a software group at a DNA company, and uh, then became a coach, trainer, consultant type person with Industrial Logic, and I've been there for several years now. So with XP or extreme programming, um, basically we were in this context, uh, this was when I was working at a phone company and uh, they had uh, some heavyweight process around and they'd moved to what was called uh, RUP at the time, Rational Unified Process, um, which is a, a little more iterative than a waterfall, but it's, it's still a really large process. So there's um, something like 100 workflows, there's dozens of documents to write, there's a lot of interactions and so on. And we were working at um, uh, a group trying to create a website and uh, uh, sell phones over the web, basically an early e-commerce kind of site. And in the web context, um, you, you've got a, a series of releases. You know, maybe it's every day, even Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. They're all different. Um, and you can't sit down and go through, you know, 100 processes and ship every day. And so uh, we had this kind of... Uh, conflict there that we resolved and we what we did was we pulled together we called it light rough but it was basically a, a small iterative process with kind of a three-week cycle and um, uh, shipping on a little closer cycle um, uh, more like a, a several month cycle to ship which I would cut even shorter today but that's where we were then and uh, uh, looking around from there trying to understand like how do we make this work um, I got connected with some of the people that were um, doing other kind of, they called them light processes at that time, was a pretty common name, lightweight process. Um, so there was extreme programming. Um, there was Alistair Coburn was around with uh, his versions of Crystal. Um, Scrum was around, other other processes around there. So we, we settled on something that was somewhat like XP. Um, uh, uh, I mean, there's details in there we can go into if anybody needs to, but, but basically uh, uh, kind of gelled onto this uh, very short cycle type, uh, process with a high level of testing and so on built in and uh, uh, so in that sense I think I think a lot of it uh, for a lot of groups that kind of came out of that same pressure that um, you know there was sort of an old world where things shift every couple of years and then it became every six months or something and you know you're moving to a web world where it's all the time you know and uh, a big process just can't deal with that so uh, the light processes and now there's continuous deployment and so on it's even faster faster moving um, they all kind of derived out of that um, within the context of XP uh, this notion of user stories as sort of a way of how we're we going to understand what to build 
and, and do. And if we're not uh, making things that are, you know, a six month block of work, um, like the traditional style, we get this big block of requirements, um, very monolithic. I need everything in here. I wrote it. So it's required. This is all the stuff we need. And we have to find a way to, to break it down to, to something we can deal with in a smaller size and, and more incrementally. And so the focus becomes, you know, how will you use the system and uh, kind of coming out of, um, scenario based kind of work and uh, talking about narratives and scenarios to understand the actual usage. And, and so we break the system down. So imagine something like an Amazon or an e-commerce site, um, kind of the high level activities going on. There's, there's searching for something, there's selecting what you want to buy and then there's actually buying it. And then within there, we can, we can expand out. What do you mean by search? Well, it could mean a very basic search. I could mean a fancy search. I could mean an even fancier search. Um, selecting things, there might be a cart is a very simple version. Then we want to add a wish list and whatever else we can think of. And then buying it, maybe we want credit cards. And later on, we're going to add the ability to upsell. So you bought this, maybe you'd like the fancy version instead. So, um, you know, within those, um, you can imagine each of these, these uh, white blocks as being somewhat of the level of a user story. So, you know, um, um, user add something to a cart might be a, a, a title of a user story um, that corresponds to that select, select cart block there. And, uh, you know, so with, within that, then we're trying to identify like, what's a small release? Well, we know we have to have some searching and some selecting and some buying. So maybe our first release, we focus on just the most basic search, a simple cart and credit cards, and now we can start making money. And so rather than wait six months or a year till we have everything fancy we envision, we're, we're pushing towards, you know, what's the least thing I can ship, make some money, get some feedback, you know, accomplish something in the world <coughs> sooner. And uh, then we, you know, future releases, we can add fancier and fancier features, maybe branch into new areas, but uh, go deeper and deeper on these things. So the nice thing with stories is they give us a way to kind of slice things. Um, each one of these stories makes sense on their own. Um, I can talk about the, the, the cart versus the wish list, and you'll understand what I mean. Um, it's not pieces talking about the cart spread all over the place through my, my monolithic requirements. I'm putting everything in one place that's related to that uh, process of filling a shopping cart. All right, and with the, the idea then of, you know, you're using these, this notion of stories and you're working with agile teams. Um, at one point, someone asked like, you know, how do we make input to an agile team? And I guess the, the shift I'm after there is not to think of it as um, throwing things at the team, but really it's more of a co-creation type thing. So um, I'm, going to I'm going to work with this team together. We're going to figure out what to do and do it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's more blending the, the understanding and the doing together rather than thinking of them as separate activities. Um, part of that is the notion of recognizing and testing assumptions and that we work together to do that. So um, one of the things you often see is that we, we make up this idea of what our system should be, but we don't really have as much basis to really justify it. And we've never, we've never really tested it. So um, um, I guess the classics are all like the, the 2001.com blowups, you know, the pet.com or whatever, the web van or something, you know, we're going to put a, a, a shopping, uh, um, uh, a shipping company in every city that's going to ship your groceries to you and everybody's going to buy it and use it. Well, there's a lot of assumptions in that and it turned out mo many of them weren't valid and the, the, the startup failed. And every startup out there goes through the same thing um, to try and identify like what will actually stick, what, what do people really want? You know, you just can't sit in a room and make it up. You really have to get out of the building as the lean startup people say. And uh, even within systems that are, are not as radical as a startup, there's still a lot of assumptions of what people need and use. Um, you'll see these things about like what percentage of features get used and it's like really low percentages because people made assumptions then they spent months working on it, delivering it and they find out no one uses it. So we're trying to uh, ship things, turn things around. And um, the, the big thing is to kind of learn the value that there's, there's kind of small increments of value we can do and, and, we can use that to quickly get ourselves some feedback and then decide what's more important from there and try and more quickly kind of get to the most valuable system we can, even if it's not what we originally envisioned. And then, um, because I'm sure uh, Alex doesn't give you enough to read, um, some things you might want to look at. Uh, the Nature of Software Development, uh, Ron Jeffrey's book, uh, mm -hmm. out in the last couple of years. 
Um, user story mapping is, uh, one of, there's really only a couple books on user stories out there. The other is Mike Cohn's, which is also good. Um, and uh, the lean startup, Eric Reese, uh, I don't know, that's probably three, four, five years old at this point, but again, uh, very compatible with kind of the agile mindset on things. Um, and then uh, if any questions or discussion or whatever, definitely feel free to contact me. I'll leave my info there and send Alex my presentation here. So um, I, I mostly, uh, uh, I wanted to also just then just allow any time for questions that uh, you all might have, if there's any, and go from there. Um, well, I'll, I'll leave with a couple. So, you know, Bill, the, the students here are all students of business, and many of them, probably all of them, will be in the role of, of manager sooner or later. You know, when we, when we look at these things and we read the Lean Startup, this all makes sense, and it all seems like a good idea, and every time I've done it, it actually works. What do you think are the most important challenges for the manager to actually make this stuff work in a you know, heterogeneous team environment, and what can the future manager do to prepare themselves? Yeah, um, I mean, I think in, in the sort of small company and startup world, that mostly isn't too big of a problem, you know, because it's kind of like all hands on deck and you're just trying to figure out what to do and you know you're in this kind of mode. I think where it gets challenging is, you know, as the company gets big and uh, um, the big comp the companies that are already big, uh, they, they tend to struggle a lot around how to deal with both agile and lean startup kind of ideas. Um, GE seems to be having success kind of merging those in, um, uh, you know, that they're, they're really kind of embracing this thing to, um, to recognize that there's a lot of things that you can shift the team. So um, I don't know, I, I, you know, I, I'm not a, a business person by training, so I'm not sure what, what gets taught where, but, but definitely there's, um, there's definitely a sense of, you know, management sort of controlling resources and managing details on projects and all these things. And a lot of that stuff uh, really can devolve into the team. They, they can manage a lot of like tracking and es you know, estimates if you need estimates and deciding how to do things and so on like that. Um, uh, a lot of times I see management that doesn't really want to let it go because that's sort of what they know how to manage but they really can't, you know, um, if you get a, a realistic plan of, you know, hundreds of activities, really nobody knows what those activities are. They're, they're much more designed on the fly, even though they look good on the plan. And uh, um, I think it's very hard for people to kind of let that go and recognize, you know, we have more ignorance than we realize, and we're just gonna have to let, let things evolve where they need to. And, you know, instead we're kind of, um, the thing we can give, you know, I think really comes in more, um, a lot of teams really lack like vision and kind of understanding of, of what success would be. And um, uh, it's one of those kind of not trick questions, but I go into a group and I'll talk to them and I'll say, you know, what are you trying to accomplish? And uh, you know, you'll talk to 10 people and you'll get 10 radically different answers on this. And uh, it's a pretty rare group where everybody says we're going here and this is how we know we got there. And uh, um, I think a lot of times the management uh, hasn't articulated that or doesn't know it themselves or, do, you know, I'm not sure the gap, but uh, it's definitely missing. And I think, uh, you know, to, to help people move in a direction, that's, that's a big thing that I, I find is often the biggest gap. And what do you think, um, what, have you seen any particular techniques where managers do a particularly good job of communicating a vision of where things are headed that's actionable and vivid for, you know, for the, the designer, the other business people, the developers? I mean, what do you, do you have any, is there yeah. any to see what that looks like? In your um, um, mostly, mostly what I'm familiar with doing and, and have done with groups and, you know, kind of people do, they call chartering. So um, um, I'm not sure how widespread this is or not, but there, there are a couple books on it and whatnot. But, but it's really kind of a um, set of meetings focused to say, like, you know, let's agree on what we're doing. Let's agree on... Um, kind of at a high level, what's in and what's out of scope for the system. Uh, you know, let's kind of get a mission statement that really means something. Let's articulate, um, we say management tests, you know, how, how will we as management know we're succeeding? Sometimes those tests are like business oriented type tests, you know, we'll know because we increase sales by 5% or 10%. Sometimes they're more, um, and I think almost healthier when they're more like, how do we know, you know, tests that our customers would accept as, as proof that things are better for them. So 
Um, one of the things we do is sell e-learning. So for us, uh, it'd be very easy to focus on like, how many people use the system? How much money do we make? And really the focus needs to be like, how much did the students actually learn? And, you know, uh, you know that, that area to say like, what's the, what's the outcome at that level? Um, you know, so I think um, if, you, if you can get to the business objectives that mean things, that's great. If you can get out to the, to the real, end, real end user objectives, uh, that can be important as well. And uh, I've seen that succeed. I had one where um, uh, it's a group doing kind of data analysis. They get all this data from different sources. And uh, we pulled them to charter together to make a charter. And they, they kind of realized, like, you know, our charter is really, you know, make all this stuff available coherently to people. And, and when they sat down in a room and really kind of talked it through, they found out, like, oh, we don't need this source. Uh, we don't need that source. That one, we just need two fields and so on. And all of a sudden, like, three months of their project just slipped off the, the end because they'd had these conversations to say, you know, the goal is we, we measure ourselves by, um, you know, what percentage of the information available can our customers access, uh, which, which is a useful customer measure, useful enough anyway. And, and for them, that gave them, told them, add this feed, don't add that feed, and, and make it happen. Got it, that's great. Um, questions for Bill? Yes, Ross, maybe. So um, specifically around kind of lean startup concepts and getting buy-in. I had a buddy who was trying to implement some sort of lean startup stuff with his team at a big bank. He started explaining concepts to his boss. He got to kind of fail early, fail often, and his boss said, stop, not comfortable with this. Nobody in my family has failed at anything in 150 years. <laughs> so I mean, in your experience, have you seen anything that works or doesn't work kind of implementing this sort of stuff in big corporations? And kind of related to how <clears throat> Yeah, so so um, I, I missed a part in the middle there, but I think you're asking if uh, things that work in kind of big corporations to help work with lean startup. Yes, but yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, I mean it, it's a struggle for them. I mean, all I big hierarchy. You know, you, oops. It's not your fault, Ross. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Bill, we had a little network glitch there. Okay. Um, at any rate, companies tend to be these, these hierarchical things. And, uh, you know, sometimes what rewards you for moving up the hierarchy isn't necessarily what, what makes it, uh, what got you there in the first place, you know. So, um, you know, uh, I don't know, GE, you know, uh, uh, 100 years ago or 125 or whatever years ago, right, they were a startup. You know, they're, they're not that anymore. And, uh, you know, in the startup side, you know, you're very lean and scrappy and you try and do things. And then... And then as you grow, you put these things in place to kind of make a, a repeatable process for things. And repeatable says, I don't let myself change. And so you build up a lot of mechanisms. So, it, I mean, it's inherently going to be a tricky problem. Um, you know, mostly what I've seen work is like crisis, <laughs> which nobody wants that, you know, but, but uh, that's the ones when people change. It's like they, they finally realize they have no choice. And once in a great while you run across one that changes because of vision, you know, somebody, somebody up up high recognizes we can't go on like this and let's let's force it and uh you know maybe the ge is more like that it seems like they've got some good top-down support on on these things um and a, and a culture that does it um there are other companies that are that are working to do this um i think it's hard for them you know they they tend to set up little skunk work kind of things um which may be great for that one project but doesn't necessarily integrate it into the culture of the company so it's it's tricky um and, and I've seen that fail to come back and fail to integrate. So I know it's definitely going to be a risk. Thank you. Yeah. Ashwin. Yeah. Uh, so I was previously working as a software engineer uh, in a company where go to market first was very important. So the belief there was agile and general because uh, you, you just have a vision, but you really don't know the features that you're going to implement at the time it's going to take. It's going to induce this uncertainty in predicting how long it might take for the entire software development to finish. So we would, we would, not go with Agile and generally stick to a waterfall model. What are your thoughts about that? Could you use Agile on projects like that where we give a fixed deadline and you know that you put market uh, <clears throat> So I, I had some break up again, but I think I think I heard the question was, uh, uh, can you apply Agile in a place where you have a, a fixed backlog and a fixed set of things to do? Is that the? Okay. And a fixed release date. Fixed release date. Yeah, um, well, the. In, in a way, Agile is fine with fixed release dates. It's almost, um, it, it's just kind of a perfectly normal phenomenon. It, the question is like, if you've got a release date, um, it's like, what's going to vary, you know, because 
we have all these theories and plans day one when we're our most ignorant about our system and we make some plan that says the release date is this date and here's all the features that are going to go in and here's the quality level we're going to get. Okay. Well, um, you know, how right are we? Well, probably not right. You know, the, the, the history of success isn't so great on that. So uh, we're, we're going to have to give up something at some point, most likely. And uh, you know, the question is, are we going to, are we going to give up the release date that's fixed here? Okay. We can say, no, let's keep this release date. And now you say, okay, well, you've got a certain amount of time. What are we going to do? We're going to try and do what's the most valuable things for you. So kind of go back to that picture ahead of the user stories, right? I may have a fixed release date with the full Amazon experience, but you know, if we fix the release date and all I've got is the basic cart, basic selection, basic buying, okay, from the day I have that, I have a working system that's as good as I can get by that time. And, uh, and you know, at any point I can say, you know, freeze it and ship it. And, and, you know, as long as I have enough time to make some sort of minimal thing, you know, I haven't misestimated by a factor of 10 or something, um, then, then I'm going to have a shippable system. It won't be everything I wished for. Um, but, but if I'm building things in that way, then I have it. Now, there definitely are teams that um, talk like we're doing Agile, but they don't set themselves up to be able to do that. Uh, th then that's a different problem. But, but at least in principle, we can, we can slice things in a way that says increments of value get it added in until we just run out of time or until we can say, no, the time is flexible. The features are what count. We're, um, you know, we're shipping a Mars probe or something. Well, I guess that's a fixed date too, but what, you know, something where we care about the features, we're replacing this legacy system. We care about the features. Um, we're going to keep going until it's all there. You know, we can, we can make that trade off too. So we've got some flex in that. And then I guess the hidden flex in there is, you know, as we're doing this, we're able to start shipping these things early on. We often find as we ship it, that some of the features we thought were critical, nobody cares about, and we can just leave them off and, 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 leaving them out for the release date doesn't really hurt anything either sometimes. So hopefully we get there too. Thank you. Other questions for Bill? Yes, Kyle Gaye. So I had a question um, about how you, um, if you create a user story that crosses multiple pieces of your technology stack. So if you suddenly in your sort of Amazon example, realize that the search function needs a you know, brand new set of IDs and everything, and that change is going to sort of cascade across some of the other features and functions. How do you, it, does Agile help you sort of figure out how to do that best and understand some of the dependencies, or is it more just about crafting stories so that it's understandable what the end user is going to experience? Yeah, so this is a, a place, um, uh, so the question is like uh, user stories crossing across technologies. So um, really the, the, it's a kind of a challenge for teams really, but, but um, the user stories I want to see are very focused on things that users care about because I want users to be able to make trade-offs like, Oh, I must have the basic shopping cart. I can live without upsells for six months. Okay. Um, and, and I want those trade-offs purely as, as like domain level or business level trade-offs. Um, and the consequence is then, yeah, every story is probably going to touch a bunch of things. Like I'm not going to have a purchase, um, you know, the actual purchasing process. I'm going to have to go out to Visa or whoever. I'm going to have to touch a database. I'm going to have to do communications and all these things. So every story is going to have some of that. Um, different, different agile processes give different stuff to that. Um, XP probably comes the best in a way, but um, XP says, you know, well, when you're doing these things, try and build just enough of each technology to support that story and then learn to evolve it <coughs> for the next story. So um, yeah, I may need a database. And if it's the first uh, story that needs a database, then I'll create the database and populate just the fields and tables to support that story. I'm not going to go create every field and, and, you know, build my whole data model or any of that. I'm going to try and be incremental about it. Sometimes, you know, it can't be perfect. You have to, you have to, uh, uh, build a little more than you want, but, but if you keep your goal to kind of building just enough, um, and then each story is more like pay as you go on the rest of the technology, um, that's sort of the, the ideal case and what we try for, and they're um, uh, like refactoring support and things like that in terms of actually how do you build things to make that possible. Um, we talk about evolutionary design as sort of a, a sort of a challenging design area, you know, but that's what we're after on the back end for that. I, I do find a lot of teams, they kind of chicken out and they start writing these stories that are like, you know, um, uh, put the, put the purchase information in the database or something. And the user's like, I don't care about that, you know? And so you get this thing where the developers are saying, you must have this story. And the user's like, I don't care. Okay. If I have to have it, give it to me, you know, and that doesn't help anybody make any trade-offs. So 
you know, there really is this kind of transition there that we push. I think we have time for one more question. Scott Wolford. Sure. Um, my question has to do with um, developing software over time. It seems like, for example, this keeping with the Amazon example, um, if we start with the simple and then each problem or each kind of optimization that we have, the, the code base gets a little more complex. And then over time, say after 10 or 15 years, you have this massive collection of features that apply in some cases and don't. And my question is, how can, how does Agile work with like a simplification process? Like if we want to make something more user friendly or streamlined, it's not particularly incremental, it's more like regressive. <laughs> yeah, so um, I think, you know, kind of on the, there's sort of two sides. One's kind of the business side of that, one's the technical side. On the technical side, um, that's really the like refactoring type tools that we say, you know, so um, uh, refactoring is basically taking a, a, a system, we're changing the system's design, but we're not affecting what it does. And, uh, uh, you know, from the programmer side, we have kind of systematic either tool support or um, manual techniques that, that try and do that. And so, um, you know, if I realize, oh, the, the wish list over here is just like the, uh, the shopping list over there, um, you know, I can I can use these tools to kind of recognize that duplication and then and then bring it together and and simplify the system from that on the on the external side. Right. If I'm looking at it and I say, you know, oh, I have these two features and, uh, um, you know, it may be that my back end is very simple. It's already recognized the duplication, but my front end doesn't yet. I'm going to have to do something to say, like, here's my new feature. It's it's get rid of this, get rid of that and, and make this new merge thing that covers both cases. Um, you know, and uh, and and recognize that I'm I'm you know I'm making a, a change that users care about, but I'm I'm making the system smaller and nicer to use because of that. So um, I, I don't know of any real techniques over there, um, other than like things designers do and things you you or inter interaction people do and stuff like that. But but nothing on the user story side per se, just other than like make a story that says fold these together. So. Thanks. All right, well, Bill, th thank you again so much for making the time. We, we really appreciate it. It's really helpful. Sure, glad to help. <laughs>